Marrakech. As the corpse went past, the flies left the restaurant table in a cloud and rushed after it, but they came back a few minutes later. The little crowd of mourners, all men and boys, no women, threaded their way across the marketplace between the piles of pomegranates and the taxis and the camels, wailing a short chant over and over again. What really appeals to the flies is that the corpses here are never put into coffins. They are merely wrapped in a piece of rag and carried on a rough wooden bier on the shoulders of four friends. When the friends get to the burying ground, they hack an oblong hole a foot or two deep, dump the body in it, and fling over it a little of the dried-up, lumpy earth, which is like broken brick. No gravestone, no name, no identifying mark of any kind. The burying ground is merely a huge waste of hummocky earth, like a derelict building lot. After a month or two, no one can even be certain where his own relatives are buried. When you walk through a town like this, 200,000 inhabitants, of whom at least 20,000 own literally nothing except the rags they stand up in, when you see how the people live, and still more how easily they die, it is always difficult to believe that you are walking among human beings. All colonial empires are in reality founded upon that fact. The people have brown faces. Besides, there are so many of them. Are they really the same flesh as yourself? Do they even have names? Or are they merely a kind of undifferentiated brown stuff, about as individual as bees or coral insects? They rise out of the earth, they sweat and starve for a few years, and then they sink back into the nameless mounds of the graveyard, and nobody notices that they are gone. And even the graves themselves soon fade back into the soil. Sometimes, out for a walk, as you break your way through the prickly pear, you notice that it is rather bumpy underfoot, and only a certain regularity in the bumps tells you that you are walking over skeletons. I was feeding one of the gazelles in the public gardens. Gazelles are almost the only animals that look good to eat when they are still alive. In fact, one can hardly look at their hindquarters without thinking of mint sauce. The gazelle I was feeding seemed to know that this thought was in my mind, for though it took the piece of bread I was holding out, it obviously did not like me. It nibbled rapidly at the bread, then lowered its head and tried to butt me then took another nibble, and then butted again. Probably its idea was that if it could drive me away, the bread would somehow remain hanging in mid-air. An Arab navvy working on the path nearby lowered his heavy hoe and sidled slowly towards us. He looked from the gazelle to the bread and from the bread to the gazelle with a sort of quiet amazement as though he had never seen anything quite like this before. Finally he said, shyly, in French, I could eat some of that bread. I tore off a piece, and he stowed it gratefully in some secret place under his rags. This man is an employee of the municipality. When you go through the Jewish quarters, you gather some idea of what the medieval ghettos were probably like. Under their Moorish rulers, the Jews were only allowed to own land in certain restricted areas, and after centuries of this kind of treatment, they have ceased to bother about overcrowding. Many of the streets are a good deal less than six feet wide, the houses are completely windowless, and sore-eyed children cluster everywhere in unbelievable numbers like clouds of flies. Down the centre of the street, there is generally running a little river of urine. In the bazaar, huge families of Jews, all dressed in the long black robe and little black skullcap, are working in dark, 
fly-infested booths that look like caves. A carpenter sits cross-legged at a prehistoric lathe, turning chair legs at lightning speed. He works the lathe with a bow in his right hand and guides the chisel with his left foot, and, thanks to a lifetime of sitting in this position, his left leg is warped out of shape. At his side, his grandson, aged six, is already starting on the simpler parts of the job. I was just passing the coppersmith's booths when somebody noticed that I was lighting a cigarette. Instantly, from the dark holes all round, there was a frenzied rush of Jews, many of them old grandfathers with flowing grey beards, all clamouring for a cigarette. Even a blind man somewhere at the back of one of the booths heard a rumour of cigarettes and came crawling out, grouping in the air with his hand. In about a minute, I had used up the whole packet. None of these people, I suppose, works less than twelve hours a day, and every one of them looks on a cigarette as a more or less impossible luxury. As the Jews live in self-contained communities, they follow the same trades as the Arabs, except for agriculture. Fruit sellers, potters, silversmiths, blacksmiths, butchers, leather workers, tailors, water carriers, beggars, porters, whichever way you look, you see nothing but Jews. As a matter of fact, there are thirteen thousand of them, all living in the space of a few acres. A good job Hitler isn't here. Perhaps he is on his way, however. You hear the usual dark rumours about the Jews, not only from the Arabs, but from the poorer Europeans. Yes, mon vieux, they took my job away from me and gave it to a Jew. The Jews. They're the real rulers of this country, you know. They've got all the money. They control the banks, finance, everything. But, I say, isn't it a fact that the average Jew is a labourer working for about a penny an hour? Ah, that's only for show. They're all moneylenders, really. They're cunning, the Jews. In just the same way, a couple of hundred years ago, poor old women used to be burned for witchcraft when they could not even work enough magic to get themselves a square meal. All people who work with their hands are partly invisible, and the more important the work they do, the less visible they are. Still, a white skin is always fairly conspicuous. In Northern Europe, when you see a labourer ploughing a field, you probably give him a second glance. In a hot country, anywhere south of Gibraltar or east of Suez, the chances are that you didn't even see him. I have noticed this again and again. In a tropical landscape, one's eye takes in everything, except the human beings. It takes in the dried-up soil, the prickly pear, the palm tree and the distant mountain, but it always misses the peasant hoeing at his patch. He is the same colour as the earth, and a great deal less interesting to look at. It is only because of this that the starved countries of Asia and Africa are accepted as tourist resorts. No one would think of running cheap trips to the distressed areas. But where the human beings have brown skins, their poverty is simply not noticed. What does Morocco mean to a Frenchman? An orange grove or a job in government service? Or to an Englishman? Camels, castles, palm trees, foreign legionaries, brass trays and bandits. One could probably live here for years without noticing that for nine-tenths of the people the reality of life is an endless, back-breaking struggle to wring a little food out of an eroded soil. Most of Morocco is so desolate that no wild animal bigger than a hare can live on it. Huge areas which were once covered with forest have turned into a treeless waste where the soil is exactly like broken-up brick. 
Nevertheless, a good deal of it is cultivated with frightful labour. Everything is done by hand. Long lines of women, bent double like inverted capital L's, work their way slowly across the fields, tearing up the prickly weeds with their hands, and the peasant gathering lucerne for fodder pulls it up stalk by stalk instead of reaping it, thus saving an inch or two on each stalk. The plough is a wretched wooden thing, so frail that one can easily carry it on one's shoulder and fit it underneath with a rough iron spike which stirs the soil to a depth of about four inches. This is as much as the strength of the animals is equal to. It is usual to plough with a cow and a donkey yoked together. Two donkeys would not be quite strong enough, but on the other hand, two cows would cost a little more to feed. The peasants possess no harrows. They merely plough the soil several times over in different directions, finally leaving it in rough furrows, after which the whole field has to be shaped with hoes into small oblong patches to conserve water. Except for a day or two after the rare rainstorms, there is never enough water. Along the edges of the fields, channels are hacked out to a depth of thirty or forty feet to get at the tiny trickles which run through the subsoil. Every afternoon, a file of very old women passes down the road outside my house, each carrying a load of firewood. All of them are mummified with age and the sun, and all of them are tiny. It seems to be generally the case in primitive communities that the women, when they get beyond a certain age, shrink to the size of children. One day, a poor old creature, who could not have been more than four feet tall, crept past me under a vast load of wood. I stopped her and put a five-sou piece, a little more than a farthing, into her hand. She answered with a shrill wail, almost a scream, which was partly gratitude, but mainly surprise. I suppose that from her point of view, by taking notice of her, I seemed almost to be violating a law of nature. She accepted her status as an old woman, that is to say, as a beast of burden. When a family is travelling, it is quite usual to see a father and a grown-up son riding ahead on donkeys, and an old woman following on foot, carrying the baggage. But what is strange about these people is their invisibility. For several weeks, always at about the same time of day, the file of old women had hobbled past the house with their firewood, and though they had registered themselves on my eyeballs, I cannot truly say that I had seen them. Firewood was passing. That is how I saw it. It was only that one day I happened to be walking behind them, and the curious up-and-down motion of a load of wood drew my attention to the human being underneath it. Then, for the first time, I noticed the poor old earth-coloured bodies, bodies reduced to bones and leathery skin, bent double under the crushing weight. Yet, I suppose, I had not been five minutes on Moroccan soil before I noticed the overloading of the donkeys and was infuriated by it. There is no question that the donkeys are damnably treated. The Moroccan donkey is hardly bigger than a St. Bernard dog. It carries a load which in the British army would be considered too much for a fifteen-hands mule, and very often its pack saddle is not taken off its back for weeks together. But what is particularly pitiful is that it is the most willing creature on earth. It follows its master like a dog and does not need either bridle or halter. After a dozen years of devoted work, it suddenly drops dead, whereupon its master tips it into the ditch, and the village dogs have torn its guts out before it is cold. This kind of thing makes one's blood boil, whereas, on the whole, the plight of the human beings does not. I am not commenting merely pointing to a fact. 
People with brown skins are next door to invisible. Anyone can be sorry for the donkey with its galled back, but it is generally owing to some kind of accident if one even notices the old woman under her load of sticks. As the stalks flew northward, the negroes were marching southward, a long, dusty column, infantry, screw gun batteries, and then more infantry, four or five thousand men in all, winding up the road with a clumping of boots and a clatter of iron heels. They were Senegalese, the blackest negroes in Africa, so black that sometimes it is difficult to see whereabouts on their necks the hair begins. Their splendid bodies were hidden in reach-me-down khaki uniforms, their feet squashed into boots that looked like blocks of wood, and every tin hat seemed to be a couple of sizes too small. It was very hot, and the men had marched a long way. They slumped under the weight of their packs, and the curiously sensitive black faces were glistening with sweat. As they went past, a tall, very young negro turned and caught my eye. But the look he gave me was not in the least the kind of look you might expect. Not hostile, not contemptuous, not sullen, not even inquisitive. It was the shy, wide-eyed negro look, which actually is a look of profound respect. I saw how it was. This wretched boy, who is a French citizen, and has therefore been dragged from the forest to scrub floors and catch syphilis in garrison towns, actually has feelings of reverence before a white skin. He has been taught that the white race are his masters, and he still believes it. But there is one thought which every white man, and in this connection, it doesn't matter twopence if he calls himself a socialist, thinks when he sees a black army marching past. How much longer can we go on kidding these people? How long before they turn their guns in the other direction? It was curious, really. Every white man there had this thought stowed somewhere or other in his mind. I had it, so had the other onlookers, so had the officers on their sweating chargers and the white NCOs marching in the ranks. It was a kind of secret which we all knew and were too clever to tell. Only the Negroes didn't know it. And really, it was almost like watching a flock of cattle to see the long column, a mile or two miles of armed men, flowing peacefully up the road, while the great white birds drifted over them in the opposite direction, glittering like scraps of paper.